Okay, this will be the first video for Lab 21, the Cardiovascular Physiology Lab, which involves a number of different experiments. Uh, and we'll go ahead and look at some of the cardiovascular physiology um, during this time. The Cardiovascular Physiology Lab involves a couple uh, different experiments. One would be a goldfish circulation demonstration. Um, the idea is to observe the circulation in a goldfish tail. Uh, what you do is you anesthetize the fish. We actually have a solution that's uh, technically called MS-222. It's an anesthesia that you put in the water for the fish. And they swim around and pick it up through their gills and gets into their blood. And much like if you went in for surgery and they knocked you out, uh, we will uh, knock out the fish and then be able to look at the circulation in the tail. So you take them out of the water, place them on a microscope. Uh, usually have a stack of microscope slides so that uh, the tail sits on top. And you can go ahead and observe the, the goldfish tail that way. Um, when you uh, look at the tail, uh, you'll see some uh, red blood cells. Uh, you may see some white blood cells. You'll be able to look at the uh, different... Uh, parts of the circulation you'll be able to see veins and arteries and things um, this is an enhanced color version up here um, that you see uh, it's uh, not actually looks like that they'll be um, opaque uh, mostly and you can just see the outline of things but but that's about it um, so you know looking at that it's just more of an observation it's kind of kind of neat to see um, so it's just kind of cool uh, if you look uh, at the circulation, then, uh, you know, it, it, you can see it move through. Here's some blood vessels here. Um, these little areas of the tail that look like bamboo here and here, um, those are the cartilage of the tail. Um, and so the muscle in between is where you see most of the blood vessels. Uh, also going across, you can sometimes see them. Um, so these, this is a blood vessel here. It's hard to see because it's a picture, but it goes across and it goes here. And this is another blood vessel going there and there. So um, it's kind of it. Uh, if you want to search for more goldfish circulation on YouTube, you can see more details. It's kind of neat. Uh, maybe I'll find one and post it or something. Uh, another part of the laboratory that we would do for lab 21 is we would look at the idea of what's called venous pressure. Um, when we talk about blood pressure, it's sort of like talking about the disease diabetes. Uh, when people say I, uh, someone has diabetes, invariably they mean diabetes mellitus, uh, which is a problem with either making insulin or responding to insulins, relatively common disease. And, you know, depending on what study you read, you know, somewhere between 30 and 40 million Americans have it. Uh, right now. So, uh, you know, it, it just, when you say diabetes, you're invariably talking about that specific disease. However, there's another form of diabetes, like diabetes insipidus, um, where uh, it has the same first name, but if someone had diabetes insipidus, then they're referring to a uh, specific disease that deals with um, antidiuretic hormone uh, instead of insulin. Uh, and the same thing is true for blood pressure. When we talk about blood pressure, we're usually invariably referring to um, arterial blood pressure. And so that's the estimated blood pressure in your aorta. Um, we will uh, kind of look at that uh, in, in a few minutes on in this lab. But uh, we also have venous pressure. So we also have a blood pressure in our veins. And it's kind of the reason why we do it. Um, one of the things to remember for the cardiovascular section and probably true of just about any scientific section is uh, fluids move because of a pressure difference. They go from a high pressure to a low pressure and blood moves because of a pressure difference. So since blood moves from the left ventricle to the arteries, through the capillaries, to the veins and back to the uh, right atrium as an example for the systemic circulation, then that tells me the pressure at some point in time of the left ventricle has to be higher than any place else to push blood. And then the arterial pressure has to be greater than the uh, 
capillary pressure and the capillary pressure has to be greater than the venous pressure and the venous pressure has to be greater at some point in time than the atrial pressure otherwise blood wouldn't flow so this is just an example of looking at venous pressure uh, you could play around with it at home even um, and what you do is you uh, stand next to a chalkboard and mark the height of the right atrium uh, it's best estimated if you uh, start up on top of your chest count down to the third intercostal space and that's about the height of your right atrium uh, on your right side uh, if you'll notice though it invariably ends right about where the anterior axillary line is that's the crease in the front of your armpit and so uh, one way to kind of estimate the height of the right atrium is just uh, put a yardstick underneath the arm and mark it on the board the chalkboard in the classroom or uh, a wall where you know you're not obviously not using permanent marker or something and then um, have the person stand uh, with their hand down for a minute or two and what's going to happen is because of gravity blood is going to pool in the hand and it'll distend some of the veins and as you distend the veins um, we'll be able to see uh, the blood in them and what you'll do is you'll stand with your side of the wall slowly lift your hand with the distended veins and watch what happens and once the pressure of the veins in your hand exceed the pressure in the right atrium then blood will move because blood moves as I just explained by a pressure difference from a high to low pressure and so when blood moves that vein will collapse so you're looking for the point where the vein collapsed then what you do is you measure the distance above the right atrium that you estimated uh, based on the anterior axillary line um, in millimeters and then take that number and divide by 13.6 the reason why we divide by 13.6 is typically uh, blood pressure is reported in units of millimeters of mercury and so in terms of blood pressure and unit, units of millimeters of mercury 13.6 uh, uh, is uh, what the difference between the density of mercury is and the density of the, your blood so uh, that's what we kind of estimated by dividing by 13.6 uh, the vast majority of people have venous pressures measured in a laboratory setting like that um, usually between 4 and 15 uh, millimeters of mercury uh, in reality uh, most people are usually between 4 and 8 millimeters of mercury for the venous pressure uh, we overestimate venous pressure in class a couple different ways one is the anterior axillary line is probably a little lower than most people's right atrium so we sort of uh, estimate that distance uh, for the vein collapse uh, too much that way uh, in addition uh, most people are often willing uh, not willing to commit to when the vein actually collapses so you see uh, maybe it goes a little farther than it should and, and that difference in both cases make it greater and that's why some people have a, a higher number um, so there's the formula the pressure of the venous so p venous equals the vc that's the vein collapse uh, minus the ra that's your height of the right atrium uh, again measure them in both millimeters uh, that difference and then divide by 13.6 13 um, and uh, like i said most people are going to be 4 to 10 although in lab we get numbers as high as 15. the other pressure that we're going to measure is blood pressure and again as i said when people talk about blood pressure they usually refer to arterial blood pressure and what we're going to do is we're going to use a blood pressure cuff which is scientifically known as a sphygmomanometer so a sphygmomanometer um, that's the fancy scientific name for it and um, the blood pressure cuff because it's arterial pressure is going to measure both systolic and diastolic pressure so systolic blood pressure is when the heart is contracting during systole that's the highest pressure and diastolic pressure is when the heart is relaxing um, even though blood pressure uh, drives 
the movement of blood and the ventricles push blood pressure push blood into the arteries to create a pressure uh, higher pressure um, the ventricle actually has a pressure of zero uh, during relaxation so when the ventricle itself is relaxing the pressure goes down to zero and that's so that the ventricle fills so it can pump blood in the next beat but the actual arterial blood pressure does not go down to zero because we want to maintain pressure all the time to keep blood flowing constantly through your body um, so uh, here's an example of uh, what happened so number one is showing when if this person's blood pressure reading really was 120 over 70 okay so blood pressure 120 over 70 and you're going to pump the cuff up to um, something above 120 you don't know what their pressure is so most people go to about 140 or 150 initially um, you know most of these cuffs go up to 300 or so and there's no reason to pump it up to 300 because uh, most people's blood pressure even if they have high blood pressure is going to be probably less than 160 so you pump the cup to 150 160 at the most and when you do that you're going to completely occlude the artery so you kind of see it here here's the artery in red okay and then coming the other side it's white because there's no blood flow through it and that's because the pressure of the cuff exceeds the pressure of the artery and it completely blocks it okay so you start to let the cuff pressure off with the bulb right here and the measurement right starts to go down so you know this is could be a mercury manometer um, it could be a more commonly now because we don't use mercury in uh, most hospital situations anymore um, uh, just a dial right and and actually nowadays most of those uh, blood pressure cuffs in most clinical situations are automatically measuring blood pressure now but um, as you let the pressure come down the uh, blood pressure comes farther and farther down and once it hits 120 again assuming the subject's systolic pressure the high pressure when the heart is contracting is 120 now since the cuff pressure and the arterial pressure are basically the same now when we go to systolic pressure the cuff pressure isn't high enough to block the flow of blood so blood spurts through okay so the first sound you hear when you're listening on the stethoscope will be blood spurting through and literally running into a wall of blood um, that is waiting to be pushed through that first sound you hear you look at the reading and you say oh that's the systolic pressure so in this case it would be 120 you use the bulb to keep letting the pressure down slowly usually about two to four millimeters a second so not that quick um, and what's going to happen is on the stethoscope you're literally going to hear um, the heartbeat and uh, each thing you hear is blood getting pushed across the cuff when systolic pressure is greater than cuff pressure and so you'll hear that sound you'll hear you'll hear it literally sound like a heartbeat um, because that's what it is um, and it'll get softer and softer until the cuff pressure is uh, less than arterial pressure so in this case if their blood pressure is 120 over 70 so systolic 120 diastolic 70 once the blood pressure hits 70 blood is flowing freely sorry the cuff pressure not blood pressure cuff pressure uh, hit 70 blood is freely flowing through the artery and now you don't hear anything okay so it's called laminar flow which you don't hear on the stethoscope and so the last sound you hear you would make a mental note and that would be the uh, diastolic pressure so first sound systolic last sound diastolic that's called the sounds of Krotokov uh, named after the Russian scientist who first kind of figured this stuff out so uh, that's how we would measure blood pressure in lab and again kind of shows you here the way you have it um, you put the stethoscope on uh, you can do the left arm you can do the right arm uh, the right arm tends to sometimes in some people have a slightly higher blood pressure um, but uh, usually it's not uh, much of a difference um, you usually like I said pump the cuff up to 150 160 uh, let out the air slowly and here the first first swish would be systolic and the last one would be diastolic um, and so that's how we would would do it for arterial pressure so this just shows what happens
when we have the different cuff pressures compared to arterial pressure. Um, and so when cuff pressure is above arterial pressure, the arteries completely occlude. You don't hear any sound. When the cuff pressure is slightly lower than systolic, blood spurts through for a brief second, and that's the first sound you hear, so that's systolic pressure. As you let the cuff pressure out, you hear more and more sounds, like I said, for a heartbeat. And then once the cuff pressure is less than arterial blood pressure, then the sound completely goes away. So looking at this measurement, right, we hear the first sound right here. So that would be 120. We hear the last sound right here. That would be a little bit under 80. So, you know, you would say, oh, this person's uh, blood pressure, right, is, you know, 120 over 78 um, is probably what you're uh, looking at there. So that's kind of how we measure blood pressure um, in lab. Uh, once we measure blood pressure, there's a couple things we can do with the systolic and diastolic pressure. Uh, one is to measure what's called the pulse pressure. Uh, pulse pressure has the unfortunate scientific designation of PP, and it's really easy to measure. It's just the difference between systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So the formula is pretty simple. SP, systolic pressure, minus DP, diastolic pressure. So again, going back to the example up here where we see this person has a 120 over 70 blood pressure, we say 120 systolic pressure minus 70 diastolic pressure, and that gives me a mean arterial pressure of 50. Sorry, sorry, mean arterial pressure, a pulse pressure of 50. Okay. Now, the mean arterial pressure uh, is known as MAP, and this one's kind of different. It's not what you maybe think initially as mean arterial pressure so as an example you might think oh well that would be the average blood pressure so i would take 120 and 70 and say okay that's 190 right and then divide by uh two right so you know 190 would give me a, a number right in between you know 120 and 170 um and uh, you would get, uh, what is it, um, 95, right? But that's not how we, we calculate things um, for mean arterial pressure. Uh, for mean arterial pressure, uh, what we need to do is it's the average blood pressure over time. And uh, we'll see this in a, in a later lab when we look at the ECG in a little more detail. But the average blood pressure over time, uh, what happens in, in when a person's resting especially is that we spend about an average of about one-third of the time in systole. So systole is about one-third of the time. Or diastole is, um, sorry, uh, yeah, so systole is one-third of the time. Diastole is two-thirds of the time. So mean arterial pressure, one way to calculate it is one-third systolic, because that you spend one-third of, of the time in systole, and then two-thirds diastolic. So um, it's sometimes inconvenient to calculate. So as an example on uh, this one, right, one-third of 120, that's not too difficult. You know, I can do that in my head and say, okay, that's 40. Uh, two-thirds of 70 is a little more difficult right and that's going to be you know what is it 46.7 right in my head i think um so uh you know it's it becomes a little more difficult to to, to measure um i like using the second formula and if you had a calculator it wouldn't, wouldn't be too hard i like using the second formula a little better um one because oftentimes and i just almost made it <laughs> 10 seconds ago in this video um that people invert the one-third and two-thirds and so uh, sometimes that gets difficult in addition you're taking thirds of one thing and two-thirds of another which makes it you know much more map mathematically complicated as well and the more math you do the more likely you're going to make a mistake so i like the second equation um, uh, so I think it's a lot easier because we're only taking one-third of one thing, and that one-third is typically a smaller number. So the diastolic pressure 
right, is already there, right? So to mean to measure mean arterial pressure, the other formula is diastolic pressure plus one third of the pulse pressure, right? So SP minus DP up here again is pulse pressure. So diastolic pressure, don't do anything about it. It's 70. And the pulse pressure we said before, 120 minus 70 is 50, okay? And um, one third of 50, right? Uh, let's see, that would be 16.7, okay? So one third of 50 is 16.7, um, right? Because 16 times 3 would be 48 plus another, yeah, so 16.7. So 16.7 plus 70 would be 80. 6.7 so the mean arterial pressure would be 86.7 either way you measured it um, and uh, you know so that's the easiest way to go is measure the mean arterial pressure over time one of the problems I have with that formula is that people um, don't maintain that one-third two-third relationship when they start to exercise and again, we'll explore that a little bit in lab, but um, what we're going to do uh, later on in the, again, the ECG lab is we will measure blood pressure. Uh, we won't measure blood pressure. We'll measure, um, uh, and related to blood pressure, we'll measure uh, cardiac time. And so we'll measure systolic and diastolic time. And we'll see that when a person is at rest, it's pretty close to that one-third systolic pressure we see down here and two-thirds diastolic pressure um, so it's a, not a bad estimate but as you exercise you spend less and less time relatively in diastolic pressure so exercise about a heart rate of 120 it's about half and half and then actually if you continue exercising even to higher and higher levels when you get up to close to maximum heart rate it actually flip-flops and goes two-thirds systolic plus one-third diastolic, so it completely reverses. So my point is that mean arterial pressure is best maintained at rest and, and measured as one-third systolic, two-thirds diastolic, but during exercise it really can change fairly significantly. So you're actually best to measure it, uh, you know, some other way where you measure systolic and diastolic time, like from an ECG. Now, most people don't do that, but that would probably be the most accurate way. So one of the things that we're going to uh, do in lab would we we'd measure systolic and diastolic pressure on a person multiple times and then figure out what the pulse pressure and mean arterial pressure is uh, and just kind of get an average see the blood pressure does change a little bit look like heart rate we saw way back the first week of school so what we're supposed to do for our experiment is we're supposed to determine mean arterial pressure under four different conditions um, the first would be after sitting for two minutes Okay. And so uh, you would look at the mean arterial pressure after sitting. Uh, you'd look at the mean arterial pressure after standing abruptly. So after sitting for two minutes, you'd get the person ready after you took their blood pressure um, and take their blood pressure again. You'd have them stand, and as soon as they stood, you'd take, your, you'd take their blood pressure. Then you'd have them remain standing for two minutes at attention um, and take their blood pressure and then you would have them lie down and take their blood pressure after lying for two minutes uh, when they're in their reclining state. And we'd compare the, the different ones uh, based on each one of those conditions. So that's kind of where we're at there. We're going to do another video for the discussion of the cardiovascular physiology lab.